everyone for coming out to our author group author reading. This reading is brought to you by Strong Women Strange Worlds, which is a group of authors supporting authors. Our mission is to elevate the voices of women and other underrepresented gender identities, authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror through events like our bi-monthly quick, virtual quick read session. You can find out more about Strong Women Strange Worlds in the handout we've provided and by visiting our website, a link of which I will throw up in the chat, and it's strongwomenstrangeworlds.weebly.com. I'm your host today, Kate, and you can find out more information about me in the handout as well. Today, we are featuring six authors, Marty Dumas, E.C. Ambrose, K.M. West, Eliza A. Bonin, Crystal Orend, and Jenna Yoon. Each author will have eight minutes to read. Our first reader today is Marty Dumas. Marty Dumas is a mom, teacher, and writer from New Orleans. For the last 15 years, Marty has worked with children and teachers across the country to promote an early love of reading both in and out of the classroom. Her latest book, Wild Seed Witch, is a middle grade fantasy that combines technology, family, and magic. And let's focus on the right person because I'm seeing Anne. <laughs> um, so in just one second, is it just me? Yeah. Somebody in the chat, tell me. Oh, there we are. Okay, good. Phew. It, it right. works. <laughs> All right, I Somehow, see you now, Marty. Okay, okay excellent. So go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much. Okay, so my name is Marty Dumas. I'm a mom, a teacher, and a writer from New Orleans. I have two kids. That's the mom. I'm a teacher. I taught in elementary school for 13 years, mostly literacy. And I often forget to say that I'm a writer. I usually accidentally say I'm a teacher, but I can't keep denying it because I have this beautiful thing, Wild Seed Witch. And so I'm just going to set you up a little bit. And then I'll jump right into the story. So this is Hassani. And Hassani has just finished the summer. It's the summer right after her seventh grade year. So it's like a couple days in. All her friends are gone. They're absolutely gone for the summer. Road trips, family vacations. She's totally alone. She could be very lonely, except that what she really is has decided she's going to do with her time now is work on her YouTube channel. It's called Makeup on the Cheap. Cheap, like, comment, share, subscribe, y'all, and click that notification bell. And, you know, just kind of like try to get work on getting her subscriber count up for the summer. If she could manage to parent trap her parents back together, that would be cool too. But I mean, she has absolutely zero plan about how to get that done. So good luck to her on that part. However, one day her dad comes to pick her up to bring her to his house for the weekend. And as they are driving over, she realizes that her dad is smiling like a lot, like way too much. And eventually her father mentions Sandy. Uh, as you can imagine, Hassani has feelings about that. Not small feelings, big feelings, super big feelings, feelings that are so big that they cover a bridge in New Orleans with morning glories. The bridge is inoperable. Traffic is stopped and not, and not only that, but Hassani is being a little, let's just say, not her best self with her father. So when her father brings her back home, instead of getting to like just peacefully sneak into her room and forget the whole thing happened, her father rats her out to her mom. And her mom says the thing that I think all kids and certainly me when I was a kid dreaded the most, which is not like just going ahead and like, go ahead, yell a little bit, get it over with. Like, and you can be mad now and then it'll be done. Oh no. Her mother says, we'll discuss this tomorrow. So now poor Hassani has had so much laid on her. She doesn't know which way to turn. She's trying to be the best version of herself. But instead of being able to just kind of breathe and let it go, instead, she clicks go live and puts a rant out on her YouTube channel. Now, granted, she only has 18 followers, but all of that is about to change because her outburst has attracted the attention of the witches. The next day, a woman with a little pink umbrella showed up at my house at the crack of dawn. My mother always gets up that freakishly early and I was up because something kept dinging, even though my phone was on silent. 
It took me a few minutes to figure out that the sound was coming from my computer. I must have left YouTube over when I collapsed after my rant. The dinging was notifications for makeup on the cheap cheap. I had 81 new followers and 147 new likes and the count kept climbing. Pretty much all the likes were on the rant video, but my eyeliner tutorial had exactly one new like and comment from a user named Annie Oki. New subby here. Love your stuff. I did a bit of me doing your tutorial. I picked up my phone and replied to Annie Oki with the link to the hug gift I had been saving. I was so happy I could have cried. Another ding. My follower count went up by one and I ran into the living room shouting, triple digits, I broke the triple digits, only to realize that my mom was not sitting alone in her pajamas with a cup of tea and her journal. She was fully dressed, sitting next to a plump lady with dark brown skin and straight black hair. The lady was wearing a pink suit with a matching hat, and a pink flowered umbrella rested against one knee. My mother had even put out an arrangement of purple flowers and put saucers under their mugs on the coffee table. It looked nice. I, on the other hand, was still wearing the same jeans and t-shirt I had worn to my dad's house. My hair was all stiff and smushy because I'd fallen asleep without a satin scarf. And I was pretty sure the right side of my face was plastered with drool. Sorry, I said. I didn't know you had company. The two of them stood up, the pink lady rising so gracefully that she didn't even disturb her umbrella. My mom gestured toward the guest. Actually, she came to see you, Hassani. I wasn't going to wake you, but since you're up, this is Aimée Lafleur. She's from Les Belles Demoiselles Pension des Sorcières in Bashri. I raised an eyebrow. My mom spoke French? Belle Demoiselle is a finishing school for talented young ladies like you, Miss Lafleur said. I came to offer you a position in our program this summer. I blinked. Even in English, it didn't make sense. Me? Talented? I was good at a lot of stuff. Math, comics, finding my mom's keys, but nothing you would call it talent except, <gasps> like, for makeup, I blurted out. Miss LaFleur had seen my eyeliner video. For magic, my mom said. She said it gently, like, maybe I might be afraid or something, but Legit, I was thinking what a shame it was that she wasn't there because of my Dollar Store Eyeliner 101 video. Miss LaFleur's makeup was perfect, but she was probably using really expensive products. It's hard to get perfectly smooth lines when you're working with the stuff from the Dollar Store, and I can do it pretty much every time. Skills, yo. The trick is you have to kind of roll it around in your hand to warm it up, but leave the cap on until Hassani. My mom's voice popped me out of my eyeliner reverie. I just want to make sure you understand that Miss LaFleur isn't talking about pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Belle Demoiselle isn't like circus camp for stage magicians. I beg to differ, Miss LaFleur said smoothly. Our girls can do anything they choose to. If Hassani wants to be a stage artist or street performer, that would be entirely up to her. Yes, my mom said, but my point is that Miss LaFleur isn't talking about sleight of hand. She says you can do real magic. My mom was holding my hands, looking into my eyes. I was looking back at her, but I wasn't. Real? Magic? I shook my head. Separately, those words made sense, but together, nothing. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it too, but Miss LaFleur showed me some videos and you should see them too. Miss LaFleur pulled an iPad out of a purse that looked too small to hold it, tapped the screen and showed it to me. Yesterday, our satellites picked up an impressive display on St. Claude Avenue. I looked down at the screen the fancy lady was holding out at me. It was a bird's eye view of a 
bunch of cars driving. The footage was good, better than Google Earth, but it didn't look like it had anything to do with me. Then I spotted my dad's convertible rolling up to the St. Claude Avenue bridge. With the top down, I could see both of us as clear as if I were sitting there. Your school has drones, I said, mostly to stop myself from getting mad at my dad all over again. No, but our satellite images are quite sophisticated. Take a look again with these. She handed me a pair of rose-colored glasses and played the video back again. Everything in the video looked black and white, except for a bright purple spot in my dad's car and another on the bridge. The amethyst aura you see is your magic at work. Our satellite imagery clearly shows your magic acting on a bridge that is still quite a distance ahead. There is no mistaking it, Hassani. You are a witch. Oh, that was so good. Oh, yay! I, I think I speak for just about everybody in this message right now that we would all love for you to just do a YouTube reading of your entire book. We will all like and subscribe. We will all <laughs> do the follower accounts. Oh, the hilarity. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. That was so good. Yeah. Our next, our second reader today is going to be E.C. Ambrose. E.C. Ambrose writes adventure novels inspired by research subjects like medieval surgery, ancient clockworks, and Byzantine mechanical wonders. Published works include Drake Master from 2022, the Dark Apostle series, and the Bone Guard archaeological thrillers. Her next adventure will be interactive will be an interactive superhero novel, Sky Strike, Wings of Justice for Choice of Games. EC, over to you. Hi, thank you. That is going to be kind of a tough act to follow, but I will do my best. So, and if you do sign up uh, today when you get that little survey and you can fill it out and you can let us know if you want to join mailing list, uh, you get three free short stories if you join my mailing list. And also you will be sent a link to the first three chapters of Drake Master. I'm going to be reading to you uh, chapter three. The long light of the setting sun cast the astronomical instruments into strange shadows that interlaced like gears across the floor. They laughed at Bao Jing's tiny feet as she bent over her charts and paper, her brush furiously moving, her long fingers spotted with ink. She had to finalize the chart and understand what the stars were trying to tell her. The celestial throne shone brightly, orange and gleaming among the vivid stars around it, but the pattern of the dark lance looked wrong. One of the wandering stars edged toward it, moving backward. If she were right, it would ring the lance and signal the advent of a radiant energy that would damage the imperial palace and devastate the Han people. Terrible danger could be coming, more terrible even than the Mongols, if such were possible. Last night's observations were obscured by an inauspicious cloud, but she had the historical record, her father's and grandfather's observations going back for decades. Surely she could bow jing. She jerked at the voice and her pen left a few drops of ink across her careful work. Yes, Papa. What do you see? Are they coming? Just a moment. I'm almost done. She blotted the drops, but one of them smeared the characters of the pole star, the emperor's star, into something else entirely. There is no more time for that, Bao Bao. His voice drew nearer, then his shadow fell alongside hers, merging with the circular shadows of the astronomical instruments. Bao Xing blinked back tears. His hand stroked her hair then rested too heavily against the back of her neck, and she looked up, following his gaze. Across the valley, smoke curled, and flames danced where the Cloud Mountain Monastery stood. A dark file of soldiers moved back toward the river far below, but another, smaller group pressed onward, up the steep track to Baojing's own quiet peak. When the soldiers came, all of this, her father, their instruments, their scrolls and diagrams, all could be gone in moments, and he wanted her to leave to dress in boys' clothing, smear her face, and vanish into the countryside, leaving the tower and their observations to be burned or broken at the soldier's will. There had to be another way. Here, Papa, the chart isn't finished yet. I know, but the sign suggests there's danger. Look at the way the clouds circle at the dark lance. 
Her father reached out and took the brush from her hand, setting it back on the inkstone. Bow, bow. There is no more time for more signs. Even if there were a greater danger than the army already at our mountain, there is no one we could warn. But Papa, he settled his thin hand against her face, a warm and comforting, too frail. You must take your eyes from the sky and look to the earth, Bow Bow. You have to go. She pressed his hand to her cheek. If they don't find something worth taking here, some treasure, they'll kill you. The only treasure I have is you, he told her, and I am not afraid to die. And the work would be unfinished. She turned on her stool to face him. Who will carry on if not for us? The future of the land might rest on this. Even if we knew on what day, at what hour a thing might come to pass, how could we act upon it? We alone are not enough to stop some great catastrophe. Even if we knew the dark lance would strike, the emperor moved south. We could not reach him. Then we should have gone with him. The shadow of grief passed her father's face. Her mother had been dying when the last of the emperor's family fled. She had been too weak to travel, and they dare not move her. This last time, Bao Xing, be a dutiful daughter and leave your father to his fate. She rested her, lowered her head, her fingers hesitating over the brush, then taking up the handle of the cane that hung from the side of her work table. She propped herself on it and made her cautious way to the stairs, inching down them. When her father wasn't there, she usually dropped to her bottom and bumped her way down as she had when she was a child. But young ladies of marriageable age could not behave in such a way. Baoxing descended as far as the second floor, outside the room where her mother had died. She used to pause and glare on the long, tedious way up the stairs. Her mother's courtly wish for her future had crippled her, binding her feet to make her the perfect bride. After mother's death, Papa couldn't bring himself to let Baoxing go, and so it was her father's gifts she took up instead, her father's work that she pursued, and her father's dreams she took into her heart. Her mother's dream had given her nothing but pain and sorrow. Carved into the closed door, double happiness suggested the devotion her parents had known in their own marriage. Baoxing had rejected all of that, stuck only with her miniature feet as a reminder of what might have been. Hide herself as a boy, and she could hobble through the mountains, begging for her keep, doing what she must to honor her family. She blinked away tears, picturing her father dead, picturing her mother dead years before, her face made up perfectly, her paint, her hair complementing her great beauty. Her mother was pleased, at least, not to grow old and ugly, but to pass from the world at the summit of her splendor. A dutiful daughter. Her father had said she was his only treasure. Might there be another way to show her duty and to honor her father, a way where they both could live and even continue their urgent work? Perhaps by setting aside her father's legacy, she could preserve it and him. The door creaked inward and she hobbled through into her mother's domain, a foreign place of rich fabrics, delicate embroideries, bottles of paints and drawers full of gold and pearl combs to pin up the silken darkness of one's hair. Baoxing closed the door behind her and sat at the table, picking up a bronze mirror, startled to find the faint image of her mother staring back at her. In the years she had been her father's daughter, she had become her mother's as well. The time had come to reveal it. Baoxing worked as carefully as she ever had on a chart of stars. She dressed in a robe so fine that it caught upon the roughness of her hands. She painted her face with pearl dust into a pale, perfect moon. She applied rouge to her lips and cheeks and tweezed away her brows, drawing them in perfect form. She combed back her long hair and twisted it into careful knots, tucking in a series of golden combs shaped like butterflies that jingled with jewels. At her ears, she hung a pair of enormous pearls. On her tiny feet, she wore a pair of slippers that showed months of stitches worked in silk. Her sleeves draped beyond her fingertips, signaling that she was a woman who had no need of work and concealing her ink-stained fingers. With every stitch of clothing and brush of color, she concealed her heart, trying to embody her mother's perfection, a beautiful, painted corpse. Outside, footfall sounded. Voices shouted and someone pounded on the door of the house. Her father hurried down the stairs, but Bao Xing opened the chamber before he could pass the landing. He stumbled to a halt. Bao Xing, tell them my name, Papa. Tell them I am for the Khan, the Khan and no other. She stared hard at his widened eyes and gripped the cinnabar cane so tightly the carvings ground into her palms. They will take you away, his eyes glistened. What will become of you? 
She didn't want to think of that. Invoking the Khan should be enough to protect her, she hoped. Bao Jing swallowed. I will be his, and you will live in peace. The prophecy of the Dark Lance, Papa. You told me that our very world depends upon it. The truth must be found. He gave her a quick, fierce embrace and hurried down before her, shouting, I am coming. Please forgive my lateness. With her mother's serenity, Bao Xing descended the stairs, leaving her father's world behind her, surrendering the stars. Thank you. Oh, my, that's, listen, I can't keep coming to this quick, these quick reads because my TBR pile just gets bigger and bigger. Your descriptions were, like, honestly, I was getting teary-eyed over here, so it's probably good I wasn't on camera. <sighs> Onwards and upwards, our third reader is K.M. West. A second generation Filipina American, K.M. West writes stories for people who want to believe in magic and like having their hearts broken. Mom, wife, and general hobby enthusiast, she spends her time balancing her work as an IT professional, gym owner, graphic designer, and author. Take us away, K.M. Hi, guys. Yeah, okay. Uh, so that is, that is, uh, that's correct. Uh, hi, I'm K.M. West. I wear a lot of hats, but I also have a really big head, so it works out. Um, today, I will be reading from my debut novel, which is Wild Things Will Roam, and that is an adult dystopian fantasy. So, psychic Ander Farrow failed to fulfill his prophecy, and the world ended. Fifteen years after the bombs have torn through civilization, Liv, who is a 27-year-old woman raised in the aftermath of the collapse, is on a pilgrimage to find a priestess whom she believes can help her locate her missing brother. Now, Ander has received a vision which informs him that Liv is, in fact, this light that he's been told to follow. So as they trek through the American Southeast, which is now known as the Shadow of Appalachia, they encounter unexpected horrors. In this chapter, uh, the group, which also includes Ander's surly brother, Lash, and Liv's adoptive father, who is kind of the humorous carrion, uh, they are en route to Atlanta to find this priestess. So this particular section is told from Ander's point of view, and Ander is our resident daydreamer. Ander. The size and weight of Liv's bag made climbing through the bridge hole akin to being born. Squeezed and bruised, Ander emerged on the bank behind the rest of the group. In the distance, a water tower read North Carolina Finishing Company. Its twin bore a skull. The words High Rock sprayed over it. Welcoming, Carrion popped off, skulking behind Lash into the roadside saplings. I can take my bag back now, Liv whispered. Not a chance, Ander smiled. There were holes in his confidence. He hid them with the patch of other people's company and stitched them closed with wide grins and thin reassurances. When left to his thoughts, however, he couldn't help but pick at the loose threads. And one particular thread always hung free. For most of his life, it caught under his nails and weaved into his clothes, a constant reminder of a destiny he was meant to fulfill. Without knowing his course, he just had the hope he would rise to the occasion. When that worry tickled at him, he usually just tied it off and found the nearest body with which to distract himself. But now that thread had a name and a face. She smiled at him through warm brown eyes. Almond skin encapsulated his entire destiny. The silent lines of Liv's lips, her face, and the curves of her lashes formed a great poem for telling the epic which they must undertake. Liv was also a person. She grieved. He wanted to give her space, but the intensity of her presence set his mind on edge. Empathy was his way in. Overt charm would only slow the process. Bricks scattered everywhere. The titular finishing company had long been destroyed, though they were too far beyond the radius of the bombs for that to be collapse issue. The word civilized flowed distantly through Ander's mind, followed closely by the images of the blasts. Tiny explosive splashes rippled across the landscape. It had come on so fast and so violently that there was no time to prepare, no time to register, no time at all. Or maybe there was, he reflected, just no one thought it would ever actually get this bad. Those months before, people were angry, angry with a brutality that had grown ferocious for its years of repression. That last day before, he sat across from his grandmother and brother in their camper. Their excitement palpable as she spoke, Purry Dodge had said, you have to let the light guide you. Ander, pop on up there and see if anyone's home, would you? Ander startled at Lash's voice. The water towers loomed above them. Apparently, he'd lost himself in thought. Me? 
Of course you, who else? Anders swallowed his offense. The hole in his esteem threatened to rip open, but he distracted himself with silver linings. His brother was an inherent antagonist, but his gruff only made Ander appear more pitiable, more endearing, he hoped, as he stripped both packs and laid them at Liv's feet with a knowing wink. As he turned toward the towers, he blinked. For a moment, he stood as the proud proprietor of the North Carolina Finishing Company, staring up at his mark on the world. A few seconds later, Ander was back in his body, realizing that there was nothing in this world named for him. The rusted metal ladder groaned under his weight. To brave daring feats was a pharaoh forte, and Ander offered the group below a glimpse at one of his best angles. He swung haughtily from the rungs, releasing a hand to wave at his friends. As he returned his hands to the ladder, he pretended to let his feet slip, instead supporting himself like a human flag. While he hung there, he blinked and found himself staring into the face of a woman who favored Liv. Her smile was broad, shaped like a half moon. Oh, my sweet Cheshire cat, she said. Are you hungry? Blink. Cold rungs stung beneath his hands. Carrion and Liv clapped softly. Showboating, yes, but people loved a good show. Maybe even more now that entertainment was scarce. Ander bowed his head, scanning her distant face for signs of approval. Her smile lifted him, the remaining 85 feet of climb less daunting. His brother's face frowned. Leander, watch out. Ander glanced up just in time to see the spear descending upon him, releasing his grip to fall the 15 feet below. Air sucked through his lungs as his feet struck the ground, limber joints pulsing under the impact as he tucked and rolled. His shoulder throbbed. The spear had glanced him. A small about, amount of blood welled from the wound. Well, Lash said flatly, was anyone home? I don't know if anybody's home, Ander answered, dusting himself off but their spears definitely are. Uh, Wild Things Will Roam is available now anywhere you can order books. I am currently deep in the midst of writing both the sequel, which is called Run You Hunted Things, uh, which picks up right after this book ends, uh, and the prequel, which is called Broken Things We Call Love, which is more heavily focused on uh, Filipino mythology. So thank you for letting me read today, and I can't wait to hear the rest of you guys. Ah, oh, that was so good. I loved some of the descriptions you used, I was just saying in the chat, I love the, the like, I don't know if they're home, but their spheres are. That's such a good line. Moving on. Our fourth reader is Aliza Bonin. And I might have just mispronounced your name, so I apologize, but I tried my best. Uh, she was born and raised in the Philippines, after which she moved to the United States to study chemistry and oceanography. Publishing a book has been her childhood dream, and she is thrilled to share her stories. She is the author of Dauntless and Stolen City. And I am still seeing KM, and I don't know if that's me or if that is everybody. Uh, I think I, I need to talk. You. Oh, good. There you are. Now I see you. All right, mm -hmm. take it away. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elisa Bonin, the author of Dauntless. And the only thing you need to know about this scene is that we are in a fantasy world. Our protagonist is a teenager who's just been stood up by the girl she likes. She's kind of upset about that and is probably about to make some really bad decisions. So, Sari looked down at the dark world below. The rainforest looked like it always did, anywhere in the world. She could have been looking out at the view from her settlement or the view from Elia. It was always the same, a constant overpowering presence, watching waiting. She didn't know how long she stood there until she saw the light. Hours, maybe, minutes. But when she saw it, she stirred, looking more closely. It was faint, a glimmer in the darkness, but it was bright enough to catch her eye. It winked out almost instantly, making her think she had imagined it. And then she saw it again. It took her a moment to understand what she was seeing. The light was moving through the trees in the world below. It didn't have the flickering quality of a torch or the steady orange glow of lantern light. There was something cold about it, something eerie. It was strange, and her time in the settlement had given her little taste for strangeness. The light gleamed through the trees once more before disappearing beneath the cover of branches. It reappeared again a moment later, slightly ahead of its original position. Sari frowned in frustration. Her fingers itched to reach for a weapon, and she thought about running back to Ashai's apartment for her bow. But no, there was no time. The light was still moving. If she left now, she doubted she would find it again. 
Making her decision, Sari squinted at the light, fixing its position in her memory. Then she ran back along the branch. On the outermost branches, there were ladders everywhere, and it didn't take her long to find one. She scrambled down it quickly enough to turn the palms of her hands raw and tender. Above her, the great expanse of the city spread out, but on the forest floor, she was alone. Even in the heart of the known world, even so close to the city of valor, people still felt awed about being on the ground at night. Sari felt a rush of fear, but her travels from Elia to the settlement and then to Pathaya had steadied her. She gave the ladder one last look, making sure she remembered its placement, then ran off after the light. The rainforest was quiet, the only sound the chittering of nocturnal insects and far-off animal calls. She made her way along a well-worn track that led to the city's fields, moving slowly. She tried her best to stay quiet, not wanting to draw attention to herself or to scare the light away. She didn't see the light again for some time, long enough that she wondered if she had dreamed it. Just as she was about to give up and head back to the city, she saw something glittering ahead. Now that she was on the same level as the light, she could see it more clearly. It was a steady, cold light, white tinged with blue. She had never seen anything like it before, and the sight rooted her in place. A ghost? No, of course not. Ghosts were tales for children. Ithim would laugh if he'd heard he, she'd even thought that. There had to be some other explanation, something rational. Sari crept forward, trying to make as little noise as possible as she edged toward the light source. It had stopped moving. As Sari drew closer, she realized why. There was a small clearing ahead, where a tree had fallen after being struck by lightning. Two people stood in the clearing next to the hollowed out husk of that tree and one of them held the light. Sari scrambled up the roots of one of the bordering trees and pulled close to its trunk, peering around to get a better look at them. The one holding the light was a man. He was older, his skin leathery and hair gray, but he carried himself with an air of command. He wore a thin cloak over what looked to be a simple tunic and trousers. She saw no evidence of armor. His belts were fastened with buckles that gleamed coldly in the pale glow. Sari wondered if they were fashioned out of stone. He held the light itself in his hand. It was coming from some sort of blue crystal, one that filled Sari with a sense of unease. It took her a moment to understand why. The crystal looked a lot like the kind that grew out of beasts. He was talking to someone, a smaller figure with her back to Sari. They were speaking softly, but Sari recognized the low, urgent tones of an argument. The girl had her back to her, so Sana, Sari couldn't see her face, but the cloak she was wearing and her style of dress told Sari that it could be no one else. It was Sana. She said something in an urgent voice that Sari couldn't make out. When the man responded similarly, Sari realized what was happening. It wasn't that she wasn't close enough to make out the words. It was that she couldn't understand the words at all. The man and Sana were speaking and their words seemed to have meaning to them, but they weren't words she knew. It was like she was in a daze and could no longer understand human speech. It was as fascinating as it was unsettling, and Sari found herself leaning closer, trying to hear them better. There was only one word she could understand, one they spoke with enough frequency to give Sari chills. Vethaya. Even without understanding them, she recognized their tone. Whatever the man was saying, Sana wasn't pleased. She was defensive, her shoulders raised, and her hands clenched into fists. It was a posture intimately familiar to Sari. She'd seen it in other people her age, people who had just barely passed the test to call themselves adults, people who bristled at older adults treating them like children. Who was the man to Sana? Where did he come from? Why were they speaking like that? Sari pressed herself flat against the tree, trying to shift around so she could get a better look. That was when she heard it a sound that pricked up all the hair on the back of her neck and made her fight not to run. A beast's growl. Something padded its way out into the clearing, coming to stand behind the man. An abensit, eyes gleaming in the light. Sari opened her mouth to cry out a warning, but the man did not seem scared. Impossibly, he reached his hand back, and the beast pushed its head into the touch. The man's fingers crept up the beast's head, 
scratching it behind the ears almost lazily, and the beast let out a pleased, guttural sound. Sari stared, watching as the beast closed its eyes in pleasure, rubbing its head into the man's hand. A thought occurred to her, although it made no sense. It was like telling her the sky was red instead of blue, or that rain fell upward. The beast listened to him, like a pet. Keeping his hand on the beast's head, the man fixed his eyes on Sana. He said something curt, and even though Sari didn't understand the words, she knew the tone. End of conversation. You'll do as you're told. Sana tensed, and Sari thought she would protest more. But then her shoulders slumped in defeat, and she bowed her head, muttering something sullen under her breath. She didn't seem to care about the beast at all. Other beasts padded out of the darkness toward the pair, standing in a semicircle around them. Two were Abedzit, the other two smaller and lizard-like creatures that Sari didn't have a name for. How many more were lurking just out of sight? They were all standing around the man, watching him closely. Beasts organized into ranks, waiting for orders like a valor before an engagement. This wasn't just an argument, Sari realized. This was a council of war. Oh, I, I'm, I'm literally speechless. This is so good. Is this book out now? Can I buy a copy right now? Can we just end this whole thing? And you oh, just it's out it on the 19th of July. Perfect. So it's out 19th in, of July. Uh, a month and a couple of weeks. Everyone knows where now. I'm going to be the 19th of July. It's reading this book. <laughs> Our fifth reader is Crystal Orend. Crystal is the author of two cross-genre novels, The Amalgamist and Kayal, the prose and poetry collection Heartwood, and most recently, the novelette Mouthpiece, M-O-U-T-H piece, in the Objectified Anthology published by Crone Girls Press. She is currently working on my favorite subgenre, a Southern Gothic historical fiction novel series and her poetry. Take it away, Crystal. Thanks, Kate. Um, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I'm loving that we're doing this on Zoom because the idea for this story actually started at the beginning of the pandemic because of Zoom, I'm blaming Zoom for the story. Um, it deals a lot with some of the isolation people felt or the constant, um, you're on mute, you're on mute. I, did you know you're on mute? Can you unmute your line? And that's where the ideas sort of started rattling for me. Um, this is set in a kind of different strange world, but very real called DARPA. And DARPA is an acronym like most things in the defense realm. It stands for Defense research project agency and the women there are also very strong women although they use different types of kind of unconventional weapons sometimes those include things like federal regulation um, on acquisitions sarcasm title one of the ethics and government act of 1978 any strange things they can use to navigate those corridors uh, our mc that we'll be reading from today is named karina burns and she's a 27-year-old Intel analyst. She's been working on an equation to predict the rate of change. Obviously, the military is very, very interested in this. But something pretty crazy happens. And all of a sudden, she can't speak. She loses her voice. Now, she's a young woman. She grew up in a military family. She's a contractor. She's really used to having to watch her mouth and, uh, and hold her tongue. But when she's faced with thyroid cancer, the cancer itself surrounds her uh, vocal cords and she is then faced with losing her voice permanently. Where we're gonna pick up in the story is right after she's had surgery and is recovered and is back at work, but they had damaged the vocal cords so badly Badly, that they had to implant a modular voice device. And so she has what is called a mouthpiece and this, this helps her speak, but it's doing some really weird stuff. This is not good, Karina thought as she headed home uh, Friday evening. She'd spent her entire life in careful, careful control and was losing it. First, she screamed at the guy in the Metro and she told her boss off. And then she did something she never did. She told her father how she felt. 
It was like something else was speaking for her. She recognized her own voice, but it wasn't what she wanted to say. And she definitely wasn't in control of it. Karina decided she needed to test her ability to watch her mouth in a controlled environment. And the best place for that was the Colonel's house. Her father epitomized control and her stepmother was one hell of a hot pink Georgia variable. She parked on the street in front of their large home in Vienna and evergreen lined sleep walk to the front door, which opened just as she was about to knock. Karina had never lived in this house and she didn't feel any sense of attachment or belonging to it, despite the rows of photos of her. Still, she hugged her stepmother, shrugged out of her coat and went into the den. Hi, Colonel, she announced herself. Twice in one week, this is a treat, come sit down. He moved the pile of books on the chair to the floor for her. You know you have built-ins for books, she teased him. Then where would I put all these photos and awards, he grinned. On the wall, she answered. Oh, is that what the hole in the back of them is for? He laughed at his own dad joke, scooting the chessboard he had already set up to the middle of the desk. This game, like the vast majority of them, ended in a stalemate before her father said, you're favoring the queen's knight. Sometimes you have to risk it. Over dinner, her stepmother said, oh, I hear you're working with your father now at the Pentagon. Karina will be presenting her change equations on Monday at Fort Meade, the colonel said. Did you make those edits we talked about all set? Yes, I did, she answered, but I'm really worried about it. Her stepmother and father looked at her in puzzlement. She never expressed worry about anything. Is Chief Reyes giving you problems? The colonel asked. His deputy, she answered. But she had no intention of disclosing this. She had come here specifically to test her control over her own voice. And here she was, spilling her guts. She told them almost everything. The harassment, the fantasy league, Reyes putting her on admin duty. She watched as her eyes widened in horror and still she couldn't stop talking. She kept rolling right through the incident yesterday where she punched the deputy with a coffee mug in the crotch and told him that she'd crush him like his. Her stepmother dropped her fork. Really, Karina, what has gotten into you? Are you trying to get yourself fired and talking like that at your daddy's dinner table? My Lord, say something to your daughter. Colonel Burns hadn't said a word. His face had gone from fury to shocked silence to something undefinable before he smacked the table and started laughing till he was in tears and wheezing. In between gasps, he said, crush you like your balls. Oh God, <laughs> tell me again, exact words. Karina steeled herself. I said, get out of my space or I'll crush you like I did your balls. He laughed some more until he finally dabbed his eyes with the corner of his napkin. I'd have paid a hundred grand to see that. Nathan, Diana admonished him. What? They had no right treating her like that. She took care of herself. I'm proud of you, he said to his daughter. The relief was tangible. This heaviness that she'd been carrying around eased up. But after that, she didn't have the heart to broach her fears about what she might say Monday at Fort Meade. She thanked them for dinner and went home telling herself to worry about it tomorrow. And she did. And I know we're going to run short on time, so I'm going to pause there and just tell you all real quickly. She does go to Fort Meade. Does not go well. She goes on to Camp David. It also does not go well. So poorly, in fact, that three months later, please state your full name for the record, Acting Chairman Rocco said. Karina Noel Burns. Ms. Burns, after the incidents following the G7, the Senate Intelligence Committee has been tasked with investigating the acquisition, accusations against you and the entity known as DARPA. Are you here of your own volition? And do you agree to answer the questions of this body fully and truthfully? She looked at the audience, found her father, still in uniform with the full bird insignia. They hadn't brought him down a rank. In F3, she thought, the ready opening. It was risky, it was aggressive, but she didn't have pawns to lose. And so she took her favorite piece, the queen's knight out first. 
Yes, she answered. And from the records, you'll see that the voice implant has rendered me incapable of lying. And then she did the most badass thing ever. And I hope you guys will read it. Thank you for having me. No, but you, no, no, you can't, you cannot just stop it. And then she did the most badass thing ever. I need to know. We're going to connect afterwards and you're going to, you're going to whisper it into my ear. I'm also going to, you know, just like buy all of your books. <sighs> ah! Thank you. All right. Moving on to our fifth and fi- uh, our sorry, our Sixth and final reader is Jenna Yoon. Jenna Yoon studied art history at Wellesley College and received her master's degree in Korean art history from Iwa Women's University. She's lived about half her life in both Korea and the United States. When she's not writing, Jenna loves to travel, find yummy eats, play board games, and take skincare very seriously. Currently, she lives in Austin, Texas. Over to you, Jenna. Hi, um, my name is Jenna Yoon, and I'm the author of Leah Park and the Missing Jewel. Um, Before I read, to tell you a little bit about the story, Leah Park is a Korean-American tween, and her her family belongs to a secret magic organization, which she's always wanted to be a part of, except for one big problem. She doesn't have any magic. So she decides, you know what, she'll be part of the normal people world instead. And so one day she gets an invitation to the birthday party of the year, which she believes is going to change her life, make it so much better. Um, She, her parents forbid her from going, but she sneaks off and goes anyway, which sets off a whole chain of events leading to her parents being kidnapped. Um, She travels with her best friend, June. And they follow the clues left behind by her parents to South Korea. And she needs to recover this dragon jewel before it's too late. So (laughs) I'll be reading a little bit from chapter one. Left foot forward, left foot back, right foot forward, right foot back. I closed my eyes and moved to the sound of the beating drum. My arms swept through the air as I drew a figure eight using alternating circular motions. Loosen your legs, Leah. You need to relax, instructed Master Chino. Ne, Sansingnim. Yes, teacher. Even before he said it, I knew. Nerves had gotten the best of me and my legs were too stiff. I tightened the belt around my uniform and took a deep, deep breath to clear my mind. In front of me, June stepped in perfect rhythm with the beating drum. To the untrained eye, it probably looked like we were dancing, but this was actually a pretty deadly practice called taekyeon, a traditional Korean martial art. Even before taekyeon was officially listed as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage, we've been practicing it for centuries, keeping it alive. June glanced at the holographic image of Master Juno shooting out from the silver box in the middle of the room. Master Juno clapped his hands and to no one's surprise said, excellent Pumbaki June. I wanted to roll my eyes, but I smiled and nodded in agreement. Plumbaiki, or stepping on triangles footwork, was super important, and today, June had it down. Maybe I'd be just as relaxed as June if my magic power manifested like his had. Everyone knew that if you didn't have any inkling of magic by the age of 12, it was most likely something that would never happen. I turned 12 a few months ago. Normally, I was pretty good at taekyeon, but I couldn't concentrate today. Feelings of dread welled up in the pit of my stomach. I knew how all this would end not well, because too bad for me, the annual exam to get into the International Magic Agency sponsored school had three parts, taekyeon, academics, and magic. It really wasn't fair. I was so much better than June, but he could do the one thing I couldn't, no matter how hard I tried. We'll do one round of sparring, Master Chino said as he sat down on a chair. Nay, we strapped on chest guards and helmets. I patted my arms and legs. This was supposed to stimulate blood flow and circulation. After a brief moment, we faced each other and focused on our footwork, swaying back and forth. The key was to maintain eye contact, read the situation, and react quickly. June lifted up his left leg and kicked me. I deflected it with my arm and slapped his foot out of the way. Without missing a beat, I immediately responded with a high kick that landed square on the side of his helmet. June fell backward with a yelp. 
There we go, Leah. Master Juno leaped to his feet and cheered, giving me two thumbs up. Always the fast learner. June grumbled as he sat up. His birthmark peeked out of his uniform and I motioned for him to cover it. It made him self-conscious and he hated showing it to anyone, not even me, his best friend. He quickly adjusted his uniform. This is just practice. You didn't have to strike so hard. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I reached out to help, but he waved my hand away and jumped up. Master Chino chuckled. That's what the protective gear is for. We must practice hard to be ready. We stood shoulder to shoulder and bowed to Master Chino. He bowed back and said, keep practicing together. You're more than ready for the exam. Red lights flickered on the silver box and the image of Master Chino faded away. After we changed, we sat down on the foam mat and stretched. I reached for my toes and pressed my face against my knees. The backs of my legs burned from the session today. June rubbed his hands together and chanted Yakson, medicine hands. Ever since I'd known him, which seemed like forever, he'd always had this ability, lucky him. Once his hands started to glow in an orangish color, he placed them on his shoulder. The color transferred from his hands and enveloped the injured area. Even though I'd seen him do this a million times, it never got boring. I mean, how cool was it that you, he could heal himself? So basically, as long as he didn't get fatally wounded, he could heal himself just like that, which is why his complaining that it hit him too hard was just ridiculous. He moved his neck side to side as he rolled his shoulder. Good as new, I forgive you for pummeling me. I should have gone even harder, I joked back. Have you gotten your power yet? I shook my head and took in a deep breath. It's too late for me. We could keep practicing. Maybe it'll show up soon. There's still time. Things weren't looking so good for me. People were either born with magic powers or they weren't. Simple as that. It wasn't entirely dependent on genetics, more like luck of the draw. But I had heard that if you were born into a family of magic, the odds of having powers yourself were higher. I doubted being born to parents with very low doses of magic helped my chances. Appa had eidetic memory, better known as photographic memory, a pretty useless skill in a day and age when everything could be looked up on the phone. Oma had the power of, wait for it, flexibility. And she wasn't even that flexible. Yoga level flexible, not superhero level. So my gene pool wasn't all that great. All I ever wanted was to be part of IMA, fight monsters, and be one of the four protectors of the world. Of course, normal people couldn't actually see monsters. They concealed themselves well, blending in with humans. Some minded their own business, while others, the ones we were trained to fight, they were the bad ones. End the world, steal your soul, open the gates to the spirit world type of bad. <sighs> that was, I loved all the different bits of humor in there. And all, like, I was, I had to keep checking my mic and make sure I was muted because I was cracking up over here. I love that. Thank you so much to our readers and for everyone who came out today. Mm -hmm.